this time, I'd like for us to uh, think briefly about understanding redemption through the wilderness. Uh, another title would be something like uh, Walking Through the Wilderness with Jesus or something like Discovering Jesus in the Wilderness. So uh, here is the wilderness map and the title and I'm teaching from this book uh, the covenant of the torch written by Reverend Abraham Park and this is the second book in the history of redemption series and uh, one of the uh, reasons why uh, a lot of people buy this book is because of this map. Uh, of course, the content of the book is what explains the map. But to me, this ma map is like, uh, it says a uh, map of the Exodus and the wilderness journey. But to me, this map is the map of my life, uh, faith in Jesus Christ, my walk and journey in Christ Jesus. And uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 38, uh, Acts 7, 38 tells us, we can turn to our Bible. Oops. Acts chapter 7, verse 38, it says, This is the one who was in the congregation. And it says, e Ecclesia. Uh, are you, are, can you see my screen? Uh, is that, is, is it okay? Am I the only one that's not seeing my screen here? Um, Okay, thank you, thank you. you. If you if my screen is too small, you might want to pin it so it becomes a bigger screen. Uh, so in Greek, it's it's ecclesia, which is also used as uh, to refer to um, church. And ecclesia, ec, it, part of uh, it, it has two words. It's a combination of two words, ek, which means out of or out from and klesia is a, a nominal form of kaleo which means to call to so uh, ecclesia means those who are called out literally and you and i were called out of our bondages of sin, sin and from the world of sin and the israelites were called out in this context from egypt and therefore they are called the called outs or the, those who are called out. And that in English is translated at times as assembly or congregation or even church. So this is the one who was in the congregation or the church in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai. So therefore, uh, the Israelites walking in the wilderness can be considered and apply to our life today as our life in the church. We are the congregation. We are those who are called out. And also in Revelation chapter 11, it says, and their, body, uh, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now, uh, the Lord was not crucified in Sodom, Sodom or Egypt, but uh, figuratively and according to the spiritual significance, it refers to, to Sodom and Egypt as a place of sin that caused the Lord to be crucified. And therefore, Egypt refers to the world of sin where we were slaves under the bondage. But through the Passover lamb, uh, and in the Gospel of John, uh, John the Baptist uh, testifies that Jesus is the lamb, behold the lamb, that carries, takes away all of our sins, sins, sins of uh, uh, this world. So um, through the Passover, through the lamb, who is Jesus Christ, we are called out into the wilderness, and therefore this wilderness journey is a journey from Egypt to Canaan and this journey uh, is not a straightforward journey uh, later we will find out but it's a very long 40-year wilderness journey 
and around and around and around and around and then finally down south and then up into Canaan. That's how complicated our life of faith becomes. And, and what can we learn from this first campsite through the 40, 42 campsites all the way to Gilgal, which is in Canaan. And through that process, we can learn uh, our, the process and progress of growth in our life of faith and God's redemptive work. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are ha we, our task is to find Jesus in this wilderness. Where is Jesus in this wilderness? Uh, some people say might say, "Hey, that looks like a J there." No, that's that's not how we're gonna look for Jesus. But uh, we are going to uh, go step by step. But even from the beginning of beginning and the end, what brackets this wilderness journey tells us about Jesus. So in the first hour, we're going to think about the beginning. Uh, why why was the wilderness journey necessary why was it necessary is it god's plan or was it uh just a result of uh, somebody's disobedience and it was a punishment or it was uh just happened that it ha happened uh, so let us look at genesis chapter 15 verses 13 through 16. Genesis chapter 15, 13 through 16. And this is a covenant that God gave to Abraham. And here, uh, this is the covenant of the torch. Uh, covenant of the torch. When it, God comes to promise Abraham two things. God says, you will, I will give you descendants, children. And we learned about the importance of this, the promised seed last time as we were talking about the genealogies. And this, uh, God says, you will be, you will have children as many as the stars in the sky. And then he says, I will give you the land. So Abraham believes God when God says, I'll give you so many descendants when Abraham did not have one son yet. And Abraham somehow believes and God considers that righteous. And then God says, I'll give you this land. And which one do you think is easier in, in our concept, in, in our understanding, our possibilities? You're about 90 or 80 something years old. And, uh, God says, you'll be as, you'll be a father of many, many, many descendants. And you don't even have one son yet. Can you believe that? Or, or better? Or when God says, I'll give you that land, which is easier? I think giving us that, giving me that land, it might be easier. But uh, God, Abraham asks God a question: God, how do I know that you? When God says, "I'll make you the father of many de descendants," Abraham believes. He says, "Amen." And God says, "You're righteous for believing." But then, when God says, "I give you that land," he says, "God, how do I know that you'll give me that land?" And so God brings Abraham and, and instructs him to give him a sacrifice, and then. Um, he sees here, uh, when, uh, he fell, uh, he, uh, verse 12, when, uh, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And then God spoke to Abraham this message from verses 13, verse 13 through 16. And then in verse 17, it came about when the sun had said that it was dark, it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. And on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and so on. So uh, that's why it's called the covenant of the torch. And the way God uh, did this is a, a, a way that... Uh, nations made treaties and, and covenants during that time. Anyhow, uh, the, let us look at the content of this covenant. Okay, And verses 13 through 16, it says, God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land 
that is not theirs. So this is speaking about, and, and it says where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. That's the time in Egypt. Now, this is even before Abraham had Isaac or even Ishmael. And God spoke about their descendants spending time under the bondage of the Egyptians. 400 years. And then, verse 14, for I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterward, they will come out with many possessions. Did that happen? Yes. When the Israelites were coming out, the Egyptians gave them a lot of their treasures and money. Uh, and so God spoke about that already. And verse 15, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Verse 16 is what we're going to think about. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites. Uh, Amorite is not yet complete. He says, in the fourth generation, you will return here. Here, where is here? Canaan. So God says, for in the fourth generation, you will return here. That's the Exodus and the wilderness journey back to Canaan. Okay. So the clue and the question is the fourth generation. Who is that? God is speaking to Abraham and to your fourth generation. So Abraham is the first gen generation. And we're speaking and God is speaking his descendants, descend, uh, the seed of the covenant. So Isaac is the second generation. Third, of course, Isaac had two sons uh, in the beginning, right? Uh, two sons. The first one is Ishmael. The second is Isaac. Uh, sorry. The first one is Esau and second is Jacob, right? So, but among, between the two of them, Jacob is the one that takes the birthright and the covenant of God. Now, the problem is here. Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter. Which one is the fourth generation that God is speaking about? Which one? Now, it says in the fourth generation, they will return. Which fourth generation, which son of Jacob returned to Canaan? Do you know? Yes, you're right. I know you're just being shy and being humble and not answering me. But uh, you're right. Uh, no one. <laughs> they all died in Egypt. That generation all, all died in Egypt. And therefore... Uh, no one. So who, who is that fourth generation? Hmm? Uh, you might think, is it Judah? Because Judah is the one that continues the lineage according to Matthew chapter 1. And, and that is the genealogy where Jesus, Jesus Christ is born. Hmm? But then 1 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 1 tells us the firstborn is actually Joseph. So which one is it? Which one is it? But according to the Hebrews genealogy, uh, uh, genealogy of faith, the Hebrews uh, explanation of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, it is Joseph. According, uh, according to faith, the, the continuation of faith. So what, why is that so important? Because when we speak about God's covenant, what is necessary to carry and continue the covenant is faith. That's why we are, we can be called children of God, descendants of God, or, or, uh, sons of Abraham. We're not. I don't think, I don't know about you, but for me, my case, pretty, I'm 99%, 999 percent sure that I have no, uh, Jewish blood in me. And therefore, I have no chance for me to be Abraham's children or a son of Abraham. However, through faith in Jesus, as Romans and Galatians, Apostle Paul tells us, through faith in Jesus Christ, we become children of Abraham. So it is the faith that, be, that makes you the rightful son. Okay? And Joseph is included. And, and explained as the one who has faith. 
Now, forget all these. No, don't forget it, but, you know. Even apart from this, we can think about another thing. Uh, who is the one that came back to Canaan? Who is the one that had uh, played a very important role in returning to Canaan? And it is Joseph. So let us turn to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, verse 22, here, here it says, Now Joseph stayed in Egypt. He and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons. Also the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born to Joseph's knees, born, born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So Abraham, from Abraham to, to this time, how long has it been? The Exodus, until the Exodus even. Okay? But Joseph is the one who reminds the Israelites, God promised that he will take you out of this land and bring you back to the promised land, which is Canaan. Okay? So Joseph made a, prom uh, made a reminder and made them promise one thing. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, promise, saying, God will surely take care of you and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Of course, that was the tradition to embalm, especially uh, those of the ruling class. But Joseph made them promise, when, you go, when God remembers you and takes care of you, and he will surely take you out of this land into and lead you back to the promised land. And when he does that, it's not if he does that. He says, when he does that, you take my bones. Okay? We human beings uh, are people who need physical signs or physical things to remember. Okay? And so, do they take the bones of Joseph when they come out of Egypt? Do they remember? Okay. The reason why I'm asking is, Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus. And so before we look at this, uh, let, uh, let me explain why I'm doing this. Because our wilderness journey, our life of faith, is something that uh, God told us already, it's a path to the promised land, which is heaven for us. Okay? What you are going through right now, you're in the wilderness. I believe most of you are in the wilderness, spiritual wilderness, which is called the church. And when you came, when the Israelites came out to the wilderness, they were surprised. When after a month in the wilderness, they were shocked. After three months in the wilderness, they were sick and tired already. They said, let's go back. Let's go back. Even after a few days, they said, let's go back. How about you and me? After you started coming to church, after you, you began, became Christian and confessed the name of Jesus, came out of the world from our bondages, from our addictions, from our habits of sin, did you not want to go back? Was church such a joyful, delightful, exciting, happy place that you never wanted to go back? 
I see some of you saying, yeah, I never wanted to go back. Yeah, please do not lie. <laughs> Even I, as a pastor, ask Pastor Joshua, did you want to ever go back? Have you ever had a time when you wanted to go back to your past? Definite yes, I think so. Especially when there's trouble in the church. Do you think church does not have troubles? All the time, just like the wilderness, just like the wilderness. Why did the Israelites come out? God said, I'll lead you to the land flowing with milk and honey. They, their mind, their head was filled with milk and honey. And they came out, came out to the wilderness. What milk? What honey? You know, somebody told me, when you believe in Jesus, all your troubles go away. All your, all these good things. You come to church. You see fights in the church. You come to church, you see sinful people in the church. You come to church, you yourself is a sinful person there. You're grumbling, right? But that's exactly what God told us to do. That's the process that will qualify us to enter into the land of Canaan. And so that is what God promised Abraham. I will establish your people as my kingdom, my people, but they have to go through this. They will be in Egypt, they will be under slavery, and then I will bring them out, I will lead them back. Now, when they were in Egypt, they completely forgot about this. Why? 430 years, 400 years, how many generations is that? That's at least 10 generations and more, right? And so through those many generations, the word of God was forgotten because in Egypt, they couldn't go to church. They couldn't worship God properly. They couldn't keep the Sabbath holy. And we see proofs and evidence that they followed the idol worshiping, the idolatry, worshiping of the idols in Egypt. And so throughout these generations, the promise of God was forgotten. And now, it is Joseph who remembers the covenant and tells his people. Likewise, God chose us and God set this life of faith for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We forgot about it. But Jesus came and gave us a sign. Just like Joseph left himself as a sign, his bones, Jesus came and left us a sign, the cross and his blood. So that we can remember. And Joseph said, carry my bones all the way to Canaan. Jesus told us, take my word and receive my spirit, the Holy Spirit, that will lead you to Canaan. Okay, so what did they do? Let us turn to Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. When they were going out, uh, this is uh, the Exodus scene here. And verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. So they, he, Joseph, Joseph's bones or Joseph's dead body was not buried. It was embalmed, put into a coffin, and it was there waiting for it to be for them to be taken to through the exodus to the land of Canaan okay and that became a sign for the israelites and did they succeed in carrying the bones all the way to Canaan we don't hear anything in exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy we don't hear anything about the bones of joseph since the exodus but then later, when they enter into the land of Canaan, they go through the conquest wars and con conquest battles. And they, at the end, they settle down. And that's when Joshua, even Joshua dies. Let us turn to Joshua. Chapter 24. It came about after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, 
the servant of the Lord died being 110 years old. Okay? And then verse 31, Israel, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done for Israel. And then verse 32, Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, in the, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. So they did carry. So the Exodus and wilderness journey it decorated in the beginning with Joseph's bones. And at the end, it's like the final uh, concluding remark. The, at, at the end, we see Joseph's bones. So what significance does Joseph's bones have in this journey and to us in application to Jesus? Now, I mentioned earlier, Joseph becomes a type of Jesus Christ, foreshadowing figure of Jesus Christ. Okay? He was the beloved son. Okay? And he was given the tunic by his father. Okay? Very colored tunic. And this tunic in uh, Hebrew is ketonet, which is a garment that is worn by priests. So this, is, this shows us the role of a priest. What does the priest do? Do the work of atonement. But what happens to this garment? It's stripped. What happens to Jesus' garment in John chapter 19? I think it's verse 20 through 21, something like that. Uh, they stripped Jesus' outer garment and inner garment. Okay? And so stripped and blood stained. Blood of a sacrifice animal. Blood of Jesus, the sacrifice lamb. Betrayed by, by, do you know who betrayed him? His brothers. Jesus came to his own. Jesus was betrayed by the Jews, his own, his kins, brothers. And who's the representative of these brothers? Who's the representative of these brothers? Whose idea was it to sell Joseph? The brothers wanted to kill him. But it was Judas, Judah, who said, hey, let's just sell him. Whose idea was it to sell Jesus? The Greek version of Judah is Judas. Same name. And for what price? Cost of silver. Judas, silver. Right? He was sold and basically he he was killed in the in the understanding of their father he's dead joseph is dead jesus was literally crucified and joseph through this uh he was he was given under the the decision of the the governor or the the uh, chief uh commander Jesus' life was uh, depend or given to the decision of Pontius Pilate and was handed over to the dungeon like a cave or hole uh, prison, cave prison. Okay? Jesus was put into the grave. Okay? And before that, there were, Jesus was crucified with two criminals. One was saved, one was killed. Joseph also, in the dungeon, 
There were two criminals. One was saved, one was killed. And then Joseph said, uh, remember my bones. What, what significance do bones have? In Genesis chapter 2, when God creates the woman from the rib of Adam, Adam says, bone of my bones. What is that supposed to mean? You go tell your wife, husbands, you're the bone of my bones. What would she say? <laughs> You know, on your anniversary, get on your knees and say, Honey, you're so beautiful. You're like a bone. You, you, might, you might be hit by a bone. <laughs> but, you know, what he means, you're the bone of my bones. Bone, you ask a medical doctor, bone is where blood is produced. Bone is the structure of, of your body. You can have flesh and blood, Without bones, that's nothing. It's the structure and the very essence. This word, esem, in, in Hebrew, is also used in grammatical uh, structure where uh, we say, this is the very end. You know, we can say, this is the end. But when, you, when I say, this is the very end, what does that mean? That word very is bone. This is the bone of the ends. This, you know, essence in the in essence, essentially, all the way, fundamentally, that's what it means. Okay? So when Adam says to the woman, you're the bone of my bones, he means you're the very center, the essence, and the core of my being. Wow. Now say that to your wife. She might be impressed. Right? See, in... Ezekiel chapter 37, there's only bones left. But those bones, when the water of life touched, it came back to life. Okay. Furthermore, during the Passover, God instructs His people, do not break the bones of the Lamb. Okay. Let us turn to Exodus chapter 12. It is to be eaten, verse 46. Okay. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house nor are you to break any bone of it. The Passover lamb. And nobody knew. Why? Why, why don't... I mean, you know, when you, when you have these uh, lamb or, you know, uh, a, you know, steak or beef, uh, you know, ox bone soup, <laughs> the, the best part is sucking out the marrow and, and the bones, right? No? <laughs> okay, you like the meat? I like the bones. Well... They're not even supposed to break the bones. How do you eat like that? But then they obeyed. And then comes later in John chapter 19, after Jesus is crucified. Verse 31, Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. For the Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Why do they break the legs? Because they had uh, on the cross. On the cross, they had a little foot or foot rest or you know foot support, so that the person who is dying on the cross 
would push up with the leg because he would be suffocating. He would be suffocating, uh, hanging on the cross. So he would push up to breathe so that this, they would last longer in pain on the cross. That's how it's designed. But when they, when they had to kill the guys, they broke the leg so that they don't, they cannot push up. So they would basically choke to death on the cross. So that's why they, uh, broke the legs. But seeing that Jesus was already dead, they did not break his legs. Okay. And then it says, verse 36, for these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And then again, another scripture says, they shall not, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Okay. So this, it's only in John we come to realize, wow, this is the reason why God told the Israelites not to break the bones of the lamb. Now, does this mean if Jesus' legs were broken, that he would resurrect with broken legs? <laughs> is that why God did not want his legs to be broken or his bones? No, right? If, if God resurrects him, he will resurrect with, you know, full body. But this bone represents the essence. We are not to take away the essence of Jesus Christ. So when he says, remember my bones, literally they remembered his bones and carry the bones through the wilderness all the way, even through the, the conquest battle, battles for 16 years, and then finally buried Joseph's bones where, it be, where they belong. Jesus tells us, even though I'm going away, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit and understand my word, and I'll come back to you. So for the Israelites, the bones became a reminder. For the Israelites through the wilderness and even the Jewish uh, legends and traditions and writings tell us about the presence of the bones going along with the Ark of the Covenant. That's how important the bones were to the Israelites. For us, what reminds us, what encourages us, and what will lead us into the land of Canaan, the promised land, which is the kingdom of heaven, is the word of Jesus the essence of who Jesus is. And He's the Word, Word of God. I pray that you and I may carry these bones, the Word. And no matter what, how, no matter how hard it gets and how difficult it gets in the wilderness, you and I must not let go of these bones. It must have been so hard for those who are carrying the bones. See, those who carried the Ark of the Covenant, they, their names were written in the Bible. The people who were, who, who were carrying the bones of Joseph were not even recorded. They're not recognized. No credit. But they still did it. It must have been, they must have had times when they thought, oh, it would be, it'd be so much easier if I can let go of these bones and I just, just walk by myself. So much weight. So much hassle to represent, to carry. Isn't it true about us? If we put down the name of Jesus and detach the name of Jesus from ourselves, it feels like it might be easier to live in this world. It might be, I might feel freer to do things. But that's one thing that we cannot do. We have to carry the bones all the way. And so, here we see that in the wilderness journey, oops, from the beginning all the way to the end, we have to carry the bones of Jesus. And throughout, we see, we will be able to see today, hopefully, uh, the presence of Jesus in this journey. Today, now, fear not, we're not going to go through all 42 campsites. We are going to travel from Ramses. The first campsite is Sukkoth. So from Sukkoth, 
to the tenth campsite, Rephidim. Okay, that's it. Okay, we'll go through the ten campsites in the next hour, and then we'll talk, think about the significance of what happened there and the meanings of those names. So, again, uh, as conclusion to this first hour uh, of lessons, uh, let us really ask ourselves, is Jesus alive in me? Is Jesus alive in me? To the Israelites, Joseph, Joseph's bones were living. God said, the fourth generation will return to Canaan. He was dead. However, his faith his essence was still there, reminding the Israelites, better than those who were alive. You might say, Jesus is dead. He's not here physically. Is that true? Or is Jesus alive? I wasn't, I'm not saying Joseph was really physically alive. He was dead. It was his bones. But his message, his covenant was, the covenant was alive through his faith. And that's what the Israelites carried. Jesus in spirit is with us. He resurrected, is he's in heaven, but he's also with us. So let us look at one more passage before we finish. It's in Mark chapter 15. Now, after Jesus was crucified and he was buried, uh, he was uh, crucified and he's dead, right? Joseph of Arimathea came, in verse 43, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in, went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. I'll continue on reading. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining that this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Now, what about this? Okay. Here, uh, this is NASB. It's, we don't see a, a distinction here. But here, Pilate asked for the body of Jesus. Can you see this? This the Greek word for this body is soma. Okay. Pilate said you can take the body. So from Pilate's perspective, this body here is not soma but patoma. Okay. What's the difference? We'll we'll turn to ESV for a little bit better. Uh, rendering of these two words. Okay. ESV says, where is it? Uh, verse 43, Joseph of Ar Arimathea, okay, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Okay. But then later, verse 45, and when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Okay. Soma versus Ptoma. Ptoma is corpse, dead body. But when Joseph of Arimathea was asking for the body, this is just body. It could be live or dead, but this is the word that Apostle Paul used to refer to the body, body of Christ, the church. This is a living body. Living versus dead. What is our faith when we seek for the body of Jesus? When we think about Jesus, is he far away? Is he dead? Is he non-relevant non -relevant to our life? 
or is he alive? Is he soma? Are we his body? That's the difference when we walk the wilderness journey. So we will walk the we will start the wilderness journey today after Pastor J uh, Joshua ten minutes or fifteen minutes break. After our break. So let us pray. Before... Uh, yeah, uh, they, maybe for the first round, it's 15 minutes. Then we'll... 15 minutes, okay. 15 minute break. Let us uh, close this session with pr uh, prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to think about our life of faith, the wilderness journey, our journey to the kingdom of heaven. Father, it's not easy. There's many challenges. Sometimes we want to turn around and go back to Egypt. But Father, we thank you for allowing us not to walk alone, but to walk, to walk with Jesus. Help us to see Jesus' work in our life. Help us to see Jesus alive in this journey. So Father, we pray that you will be with us. Please speak through this week's servant that the message that is shared today is from you from the Holy Spirit, not from a human knowledge or studies. We pray that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.